I came into darkness, feeling impossibly parched. Despite my apparently damp surroundings, I could not see anything, and upon reaching up to feel for any obstructions to my eyes, my hand made contact with cold, damp wood, mere inches above my laying body. Immediately, I felt panic worn its way into my thoughts before another realization hit me. I had not yet drawn a single breath, yet I felt no desire to inhale, like the need for oxygen was no longer a concern for my body. Feeling around, it seemed I was inside a wooden container of some kind, with absolutely no light whatsoever. That's all I could determine. I felt something crawl over my right shin, and I reflectively jolted my leg in an attempt to scare off whatever crawling creature was in here with me. Either I had squished the thing, or it had retreated as I felt its touch no more. Without breathing, apparently being necessary now, I was able to calm myself a little. But the fact remained that I was trapped inside an incredibly small and cramped space, with no light whatsoever to view my surroundings. The wood felt moist and spongy, like it had been left out in the elements for months, and I began to pluck and peel away small fragments of my new prison. I continued like this for a while, until I broke through, forming a small hole above me, from which something spilled out and onto my chest. I scooped up some of the stuff, seeing if I could identify it, and upon bringing it to my nose, I realized it was wet soil. It hit me then, like a falling anvil, that the only explanation for my current predicament was that, through some forgotten misunderstanding, I had been buried inside a wooden casket. The panic and fear tore back through my mind with a vengeance as I began desperately clawing away at the coffin lid above me. As before, it was not difficult to disassemble due to its seemingly poor condition, and after a while, I had formed a hole large enough for my arm to reach through, allowing me to grab the edges and rip it downwards to widen the hole. More dirt poured on top of me as I did this, but again, I felt no need to breathe, so it did not worry me too much. My imperative was escaping from this horrible fucking tomb I had mistakenly been buried in. After a time, the hole was large enough for me to gradually begin sitting up, digging away the earth above me to make room for my head and torso. I felt worms and insect larvae squish between my fingers as I ravenously scraped away at the dirt. Finally, I could see a point of cold moonlight peeking through the surface, leading me to forcefully push myself the rest of the way out. Someone must have laid turf over the grave as the grass roots were noticeably tough to tear through. I hauled myself out of the ground and took a moment resting on my hands and knees. Not a moment to breathe, as I did not need to, but to collect myself. It was then I saw something truly shocking. Looking down at the ground between the two arms that supported me, my hands and arms were terribly rotted, dirty yellow bones visible underneath blackened, oozing flesh. Strips of desecrated skin hung like torn fabric from my limbs, supporting a wide array of colors ranging from dark green to purple. What the fuck? What had happened to me? Physically, I felt fine. As fine as anyone can feel after just escaping a buried casket. But the sight of my own putrefied flesh triggered my gag reflex, despite my lack of a stomach to purge. 
which had since decayed and become worm food along with most of my other internal organs, leaving a cavernous void in my chest and abdomen. I must be dreaming, I thought. Firstly, how is it possible that I was alive and conscious, given the state of my body? Secondly, had I actually died at some point, and through some otherworldly force been raised from the dead? With that second thought, I turned to see the grave I had just vacated. Robert M. Pilford, loving husband and father to three, 1949-2017. I did not have a wife or kids, at least from what I could remember, and if my memory served me correctly, my name was David Rustall. This was not my grave. Confirming my suspicions, the grass had long since reclaimed the soil under which I had been laying, instead of turf as I had thought previously. Just then, I heard a wooden clatter somewhere behind me. I turned around to see an utterly mortified groundskeeper, frozen in the truest raw terror he had ever experienced. He stumbled backwards, abandoning his drop the broom and breaking into a life-or-death sprint, vanishing into the night. Well... That's just great, I thought. Now I have to deal with the fact that I am literally an ugly walking corpse. I followed the brick-laid path out of the cemetery to see if I could gauge just exactly where I was. The first order of business would be finding clothes and some cheap eye-watering cologne to mask my appearance and stench, respectively. Coming out onto the road, I could see a sign just a ways down. So, I ambled over to see what it said. Pelican Street, it read, in chipped and faded black paint. This did not ring any bells, to my dismay. So I continued walking down the moonlit asphalt, in hopes of reaching some kind of town or village to determine where I was. It didn't take long to find the village the church and graveyard belonged to. A small settlement named Finch's Green. I'm not ashamed to say I spent some time walking down the narrow streets, browsing the parked cars for the perfect candidate. I eventually settled on a dark red Prius, seeing a pile of clothes in the back seat and a sant nav mounted on the dash. I was going to attempt hot-wiring the vehicle, but the owner had left the keys in the ignition. Serves you right, I thought. The clothes were baggy and hung limply on my gaunt, wizened stature, but they did the job of covering my skin. There were some air fresheners in the glove box too, those pine tree-shaped ones, which I stuck into the clothing to help with my putrid body odor. I started the car and drove a ways out of the town before stopping to switch on the sant nav. I needed to press considerably harder on the screen, given the non-intactness of my fingers, leaving dark brown smudges. But, after punching in my address, I was surprised to find I was only a 45-minute drive away. Not sure why I was surprised, I just expected to be further away for whatever reason. During the drive, I pondered on a few things. Firstly, accepting the fact that through some means I had been transferred into this body, how exactly was I functioning at all? I caught glimpses of my face when checking the rear view and saw that, as expected, the corpse had no eyes nose, ears, and presumably no tongue. Yet I could still perform most of the actions otherwise only permitted the living. How could I see with no eyeballs in my empty, shriveled sockets? How could I think 
when my brain was portioned and distributed among the bellies of ground-dwelling creatures. I didn't expect any answers to these questions, nor did I search for them. After all, my most obvious concern was, if this was not my body, then where was it? And if said body still walks amongst the living, who or what was in it? It clearly wasn't me, but I somehow doubted it was Robert M. Pilford either, whose body was my current vessel, having died six years ago. One sense I definitely lacked was that of touch, making driving much more difficult overall. I almost ran into a ditch twice during the journey, but I managed to make my way back to my hometown, then parked the stolen car several blocks over, just in case. Searching the glove box again, I found a functioning wristband this time, so took it as a farewell souvenir. My condolences to whoever ended up scrubbing the fetid corpse wax out of the driver's seat. After walking down the dark streets, a few left and right turns, I stood in front of my house. None of the lights were on. My car was in its place on the driveway. Deciding to wait a while before daring to enter, I crept inside a rhododendron bush on the front of my property where I would spend a good few hours sitting silently and watching the house. Four a.m. After waiting for a good forty minutes or so, I caught a flicker of movement through the upstairs bedroom window. I focused on that dark square for a long time, a feat much more achievable given my lack of eyeballs to dry out. The need to blink, regardless, I had no eyelids. A minute or two was required to adjust to the seemingly unnatural darkness in the window, when I could make out something moving in a consistent but rather unsettling manner. Something was slowly rotating, a few steps back from the window, round and round, at a steady but unceasing pace. My worst fears were realized when I saw the rotating figure was me, or, rather, my body. The head was tilted backwards at almost a right angle, and the arms were crossed over, held behind the back. The strangest part, though, was the movement. It was not natural movement, more like my body was stood on a rotating platform, like a cat on a Roomba. Suddenly, a goddamn raccoon emerged beside me and bit down on one of my toes. I only noticed by the sound it made a sickening squelch followed by a dull snap, and I turned to see the bastard scampering away with a little toe. A tug from its assault caused me to stumble slightly, and when I looked back up to the window, empty. I could no longer see myself in the bedroom. I went to stifle a shaky breath before remembering my lack of a need to inhale whatsoever while scanning the rest of the house. My eyes drifted to the living room window, where I was startled by the figure of myself silhouetted against the pane. One hand pressed forcefully into the glass, so that the palm was white. The skin was unnatural, modded. Have you ever skipped sleeping one, maybe two nights in a row? If so, you'll understand what I mean by the patchy skin coloration you get as a result of less efficient blood flow. The skin looked like that. But instead of reds and purples, it was a concerning mix of bruised black and ghostly white. I could see flickering movement 
where my head would be. But the darkness obscured most meaningful details. If my eyes, sockets rather, did not deceive, it looked like the head was violently twitching from side to side, pivoting on the neck in frightfully unnatural arcs. I couldn't tell where, who, or whatever was in my body was looking. I sincerely hoped my hiding place wasn't foiled that easily. After a good ten minutes of this, the figure suddenly snapped back and appeared to be pulled rapidly backwards into the darkness of my home by some unseen force. I got the distinct impression that whatever was puppeteering my body still had a lot of practice in order, and also that it would not be fearful of my current form. Nothing else of note happened before sunrise, and with the size and thickness of the brush I stowed away in, I remained uncompromised from any leaking sunlight. Morning came and went without a peep of activity to be seen. It was only just after noon when the front door to my house burst open and slammed into the wall outside. I stayed motionless, watching as my body emerged from within, which walked outside in a jerky and what I can only describe as animalistic manner. It went about five feet before faltering and dropping down onto all fours. It paused for a moment, regaining balance, before observing its surroundings. Like I had seen the night before, its head moved in such an uncanny way, more akin to the head movement of a bird, flicking around at different angles to get a better view. It was only then I saw the eyes. God, those eyes. Instead of full, complete eyeballs with irises and pupils, there was instead a dark, burnt hole in the front of each eye. Literally, as if red-hot fire irons had been plunged into them, leaving charred pits in their wake. Just then, I realized something. Could it smell me? And, if it were to pick up on the sickly sweet stench of decay, was this thing aware that I had been sent to live in another body since expired? I'd hoped that the clothes and air fresheners were sufficient, but the brown fluid seeping through the fabric suggested otherwise. It didn't seem to notice, and relief flooded me. Instead, it pushed itself back onto my two legs and walked with a wide gait, splaying out its legs on either side to brace or balance itself. To my astonishment, in what seemed like an instant, the thing corrected its stature and began walking like a regular human being. It walked straight past my car and out into the street where I saw it walk off towards town center I waited for another 30 minutes or so just to be absolutely certain before emerging in all my putrescent glory from the bush I dashed over to the door still swinging on its hinges from the wind and I went inside even without needing to breathe I could tell the air was heavy Thick was something I couldn't identify. Nothing appeared out of place in the hallway, so I strode over to the living room to see a similarly unremarkable environment. Ascending the stairs, I came to notice that the carpet grew more damp the higher I climbed, until reaching the floor upstairs that was littered with dark, wet patches. There was some kind of fluffy white mold growing around the patches. I would have been repulsed if it weren't for the fact that my own body was probably a greater biohazard than any of this particular growth. The lights were still off upstairs, but I could swear for a moment the tiny fungal strands were moving just very slightly. 
The mold increased in volume as I approached the ajar bedroom door, new colors appearing among it, purple, green, yellow. I entered and was immediately taken aback. My queen-sized bed was no longer visible whatsoever. Instead, totally enveloped by an enormous colony of the mold. There was this depression in the center of the technicolor biomass, about the size of a car tire. What in the absolute fuck is this? I thought. At least I lacked the faculties to smell my environment, but I imagined a piercing, dirt-like scent would permeate my nostrils if I did. I caught something moving in my peripheral, and I whipped around to see something retract into the ensuite door. Cautiously, I approached the door, which gave passage to darkness. Reaching through, I flipped the light switch, and just as the shadows were being chased away, a slick tendril wrapped itself around my putrid wrist. It must have not liked the taste because it quickly tore itself away from me, twitching in disapproval before retreating behind the shower curtain. If the bedroom was Mold Town, then the bathroom was Mold City Central. Further towards the back, the original walls and bathtub were entirely submerged in the stuff, which I could now with certainty was writhing at a microscopic level, made my mummified skin crawl. With a morbid grimace, I pulled back the shower curtain and recoiled in utter shock. A gaping hole bore through the back of the wall and extended into darkness. Great mycelium roots grew far into the hole and out of view. What the hell? What brought my attention was the fact that what had originally been the bathroom wall boarded with the guest bedroom. The walls were less than a foot thick, so how was this hole possible? I went to check the guest bedroom, and sure enough, nothing. The wall, past which was the bathroom, was fully intact. Confused, I returned to the bathroom and stared into the squirming hole questioning the impossibility of its existence. There sounded to be a low hum coming from somewhere deep within the maw, and before I could investigate, the cavity in my chest where a heart used to be dropped as I heard the front door swing open once again and slam into the wall outside. Panicking, I came back out into the bedroom, and stumbled over to my closet, opening the door, exposed finger bones wrapping on soft wood. Unsurprisingly, the interior was coated with a thick layer of mold. I'd rather hide in this stagnant compartment than face whatever was using my body. Peeking out through a crack, it was a good 20 seconds of uncoordinated stumbling up the stairway before my body my real body, wobbled its way into the bedroom. Unlike its previous jerky movements, it froze in position, staying perfectly still, standing at the end of what once was my bed. Then, with the coordination of some ungodly predator, it slinked its way up onto the bed, once again on all fours. It nestled into that fungal crater and sat, back straight and eyes vacant, which I could somehow tell even with its hideous ocular wounds. I was too preoccupied with the activities to notice at first, but as it turned in its nest, the other side of its body came into view. My god. This may sound hypocritical, coming from a walking corpse. But the blackened and rotten flesh, loafing off its bones, nauseated me. A large chunk of the cheek had fallen off to reveal a grim half-snarl on its face. As it sat in the basin, the thing puppeteering my body started to hum. 
which turned into a low, melodic tune, and something vaguely similar to a whistle. And that whistle danced about the musical scale, forming a bizarre yet entrancing, beautiful harmony. It wasn't the time nor place, but I couldn't help but be drawn into the haunting melody. Slowly, the song started to change. Have you ever heard an Aztec death whistle? They were instruments that were designed to intimidate the Aztecs' enemies during warfare, and even knowing the source of the noises emitted will not spare you from the bone-chilling sound of inhuman screaming. Now, imagine that sound, warped, into the most morbidly resonant melody possible. Despite the piercing shrieks flowing out of this thing's lungs, the song's beauty was not lost on me. More than once, I had to pull myself out of its allure and bring myself back to the present. The harmonizing vibrations shook my decrepit bones, and something similar seemed to be happening to the mold in the room, as if it were responding to the call. Mucus-coated tendrils emerged from the perimeter of the bed, squirming and dancing in rhythm, and began gently curling around the limbs of my stolen body, a gentle caress. This continued until I could no longer see my own figure, and the reverberant tones traveled down, down into the house's foundation. The coiling appendages tightened more and more, until the melody stopped abruptly, and they withdrew with urgency. Underneath was still my body, yet the entropic decay of flesh I had witnessed before had vanished without a trace. In fact, the skin was so clear, it was as if I had been reborn into perfection. A wet, squirming finger of mold slithered across my nape, and I reflectively drew away from the vile thing. Big mistake. I saw my head snap towards the closet with an unsettling precision, and those burnt pits, which once were eyes, stared directly into mine. Shit. The thing then leaped off the fungal bed and was in front of the closet door in an instant. I backed further into the recesses of hanging fabric in a futile attempt to cloak myself from a pursuer who already knew of my presence. With unholy strength, it reached out and completely tore the door from its hinges, flinging it to the back of the room where it impacted the wall, showering the floor with splintered plaster. My own arm reached out and violently grasped me by the neck, and it gave me the same unsympathetic treatment it had given the door, throwing me over the bed and onto the writhing floor. With that terribly unnatural gait, it made its way over to me, wrapped those fingers around my left arm with an iron grip, and tore it straight off. I tried to scream from the agony that entailed, but with no lungs, my withered jaw simply hung open, uselessly. It stood above me, boring holes into my soul with those cavernous eyes. It opened its mouth in turn, and spoke in a groaning, reverberant voice. Sweet, sweet child, did I not tuck you soundly enough into your eternal bed? Where is your grace? I wanted to respond, wanted to shout at the top of my lungs, but not even a dry whistle escaped my throat. Those soulless eyes felt as if they were snapping my willpower by the second, so I quickly averted my eyes. Fuck you, I thought. Now, now, there's no need for acrimony. Speak true. It could hear my thoughts, apparently. I'd have thought this to be a relief, being able to speak for myself in a wordless vessel, but no relief found me. 
considering I'd just mouth off some terrible power inhabiting my real body. It took a moment of this being standing over me, unmoving, for my mind to slow down a little and dilute the morbid thoughts racing through my head of what might happen to me if I stepped out of line again. Did you do this to me? With much sorrow indeed, I apologize for your transferal, but, you see, I require a suitable host. As you may have seen, controlling it will take some getting used to. I didn't feel up to the challenge, as being in front of me, seeing as I had already been one quarter dismembered. You'd have thought that this body would be numb, that nervous system withered away like drying roots, but no. I felt all the pain one would feel from being dismembered, only this time without the shock to come in and save the day. My body was filling with dread. I thought, how am I alive? Ah, yes. You see, sweet child, the body you now call your own was my birthplace, one of many. Do you think death simply comes and takes over the body as it fades into the sea of eternal sleep? That the soul willingly rejects its holder to spend an infinity drifting in the vast blackness? I thought for a second, temporarily silencing my inner monologue in hopes that this thing's mind reading could be limited. This uncanny monster. Why was it so calm after ripping my arm off? In fact, I feared its tranquil nature even more than I had seen its previous behaviors. Yes, death comes to all. It's a natural part of life, I thought. Oh, that is how you are wrong. It is I who claims the flesh of the dead in defiance of the soul and inhabits their bones long after they have crumbled into dust. It is beyond my purview, though, that I have not been here from the beginning. No, there was a time when death was not yet bound with life, and all things lived without end. And so did they live without dreams of the future, declining the long-deserved slumber of your people have become so familiar with, even when their skin would peel away and their flesh would flee their bones. I did not respond to this conversation of one part voice, one part telepathy, instead impatiently waiting for my own lips to utter a further revelation. I could not bear sitting in silence underneath the entity, but its words unexpectedly calmed me, if only a little, like it was casting a spell or something. Ironically, this contradictory feeling only added to the ever-growing heap of panic welling up inside of me. But, as you have experienced this day, lying beneath the dirt as a companion to beetles and worms can grow so, so tiresome. I do not know if there is a creator of this world, but if so, I curse its existence. To create an endless consciousness to inhabit all the dead is a spiteful thing indeed. Do you understand now? Are you one, or are you of many? I am both, one whole divided and bestowed amongst the millions upon billions of corpses left in the wake of life. You must be able to see what a shred of justice in giving myself something to experience other than endless darkness, no? Again, I held my imaginary tongue. I had no reason to trust this being's words, but the cold truth implied did not fail to make me shudder. I felt like a child, learning from a teacher or parent about the world for the first time, and I inadvertently began to believe it. So you see, a living soul can never be my neighbor, just as darkness cannot remain in the presence of light, though both require the other to have meaning. This is why you find yourself in this body. My absence is what allows you to live. Utterly defeated, I bowed my head, 
allowing it to roll lifelessly around my brittle vertebrae. This, this thing was death itself, incarnate. Regardless of its suffocating presence, how could I not show gratitude to that which saved all from the torture of life unending? Um, sweet child, take my hand. You have made it thus far, so I shall give you a chance. I can bestow true death upon you and return you to the grave, or I can breathe into you life anew. Life. I choose life. Jesus, I choose life. No. No, Jesus. The only miracles you can pray for are my own. Then I felt warm fingers gently interlock with my remaining hand, and I was pulled up from the floor and onto my feet. I was softly guided toward the seat in which death had defied itself, entranced, and I curled into a fetal position instinctively. Death then spoke the last words I would ever hear it utter. I hope this decision will bring you happiness the time before my return. Death then began to sing in that haunting tone, playing my vocal cords like a master violinist. I felt the squirming around me, and those repulsive tendrils emerged once again, snaking over my body and slowly covering it. Darkness smothered my existence as I lay embraced in an uncomfortably comforting warmth. Before the light was totally chased away, the singing stopped, and the last thing I saw was my body turn and walk towards the bathroom door. I awoke feeling well-rested and serene. In fact, I had never felt better in my life. I looked around to see that not a single strand of mold remained anywhere in the room. I sprung off the bed and into the bathroom, remembering the terror I had experienced the day before. Spotless. Nothing indicated anything had been there at all. Not even a single blemish on the wall's hiling. I came close to chalking it all up to a nightmare, until I turned to leave and caught sight of myself in the mirror not my own. No, no. A a stranger's face greeted me. A stranger named Robert M. Hilford. Tracy doesn't hate people on purpose. She's not like that. It's her paintings. They hate people. I remember her very first one. She was a kid. She painted a scantily clad woman sitting cross-legged in a field of tall grass, a cluster of threatening clouds looming overhead. It was quite remarkable, the woman's auburn hair blowing wistfully in the breeze as she gazes across the minty meadow stretching over the languid landscape. However, upon a closer inspection, something about it was deeply disturbing. For starters, the clouds were moving. It took a while to notice. They'd sift along gingerly, like unholy apparitions, high above the woman in the wayward dress. My sister was proud of it, So were my parents, who quickly pointed out my obvious lack of artistic merit. Hell, I could barely scribble a stick person, let alone a full-sized painting with blended colors, depth, and ingenuity. No one knew how she did it. Tracy hung the painting in her room, above her bed. At first, nothing out of the ordinary happened, until after dark. When the painting started whispering to me, haunted howls like furious winds on a stormy night, those dreadful clouds teased me, saying how stupid I was, 
as my mind drifted into the land of slumber. No one in the house heard the paintings, but me. This was bad. After weeks of this, I had had enough. The painting was ruining my sleep. The fact that no one believed me made it worse. I plotted my revenge. One day, after school, I crept into her bedroom with a jar full of spiders. My plan was to put them inside her pillow. That would teach her. Tracy hated spiders. Still does. Except, as I removed her pillow casing, ready to release the creepy crawlers, the painting started rattling. Then something flew out of it. A shadowy vampire with crooked horns on its head and long spindly fingers. It had no facial features, just shape. I dropped the spiders and scrammed. My sister was furious. Those pesky spiders crawled into every crevice of her room, her closet, her dresser, even her computer. One spider, a big one with long, hairy legs and beady eyes, managed to sneak into her gym bag and lay eggs. Scared her stupid. When the following week at her ballet recital, out sprung a cluster of spiders. The painting was unimpressed. Anytime I got near it, it would grit and growl. Sometimes I'd get shocked or stabbing pains would pierce my chest. This went on and on. So did its relentless teasing. The damn thing kept haunting me, especially at night when I lay in bed, trembling. Slowly, my life fell apart. My grades were slipping, and my friends and family thought I was going nuts. I tried destroying it. In panic-fueled rage, I ripped the painting off the wall, beat it to death with a hammer, tossed its colorful carcass into the garage. That ought to do it, I said with a smirk. It didn't. Damn thing came back. Swear to goddamn God. When I checked, there it was. Back on my sister's wall, sneering at me. I almost died right then and there. I steered clear of my sister's room after that. Still, the painting's taunting persisted. It was ruthless. When I told my parents, they scolded me for being jealous of my kid sister's talents. When I confided in my friends, they laughed and ridiculed. I was all alone. Things got worse. That summer, my baseball team was in first place, looking to win championship. It was the night before the big game. I was pitching. The damn painting wouldn't let me be. As I was falling asleep, I felt something laying on me, pressing against my chest. When I heard my name, my eyes snapped open. The shadow figure inside the painting was hovering over me, whispering nasty phrases into my ear telling me how much I sucked, that my team would lose, and everyone would blame me. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Swear the goddamn God I'm telling the truth. Needless to say, I didn't speak to my sister for the remainder of the summer. High school was starting in the fall. I was hoping to leave this behind me. To my chagrin, she began painting again. My parents were pleased. They bought her the finest paints money could buy. My sister was thrilled. She painted fast and furious. When she finished her new painting, I nearly died. It was another landscape, only instead of a field, it was a silver-laced city, clad with tall buildings towering over tiny ant-like beings below a speck of light seeping through the shimmering skyscrapers. It was good. I'll admit that. The way the busted neon sign hung sideways in the distance, limp and lifeless, while busybodies paraded along the surly city streets 
going God knows where. She hung it in the living room, next to the TV, for all to see. My parents were proud. They invited all their friends to come gaze at its marvelousness. Everyone loved it. She was the toast of the town. My resentment grew like fungus. I hated the damn thing. Something about it gave me the creeps, and for good reason. I ignored it out of spite and fear, until one night after a hectic day at school, I sat down to watch a movie. I forget which one. My parents were out with my sister. She had a ballet recital, which I refused to go to. Hey, Zack, the painting said, surprising the hell out of me. You suck. I snapped my attention away from the TV. The painting was trembling like an angry mother, making loud, gurgling noises. A light flickered inside one of the tall buildings. A face appeared in the window. It was the ugliest face I'd ever seen. Its eyes were big black holes. Its teeth pearly white, sharp as swords. It had horns on its head, like the devil. Then it leapt out of the painting, scaring me stupid. The shadowy figure flew across the room, fast as a fox, then dissolved into nothing. I screamed, then I beelined it to my bedroom, slamming the door behind me. Just my imagination, I told myself, over and over, curled up under my bedsheets, quivering. I was 16, too old to believe in the boogeyman, but young enough to be scared half to death. The following week was spent contemplating my next move, which wasn't easy. I had no one to confide in. People already thought I was crazy. I didn't want to prove it. I tried searching online, but soon gave up. Too many rabbit holes. I was at a crossroad. Things were escalating. The two paintings were combining forces, gaining strength. Sometimes, while sleeping, I'd hear them chattering back and forth, going on about how much I sucked and how ugly and stupid I was. Their voices were deep and guttural, like evil game show hosts. Sleep was non-existent. The damn paintings wouldn't shut up. On and on they rambled through the night plotting ways to ruin my life. No one else seemed to notice. I was coming unglued. I couldn't take much more of this. Time for revenge. One night, while my parents had taken my sister to the mall, I tiptoed across the living room, clutching my father's exacto knife. My knuckles were white, my blood boiling like hot soup. I could hear my heart beating underneath my t-shirt. I knew this would land me in a whole heap of trouble, but I didn't care. This was it. Now or never. i deal with the consequences later. With gritted teeth, I plunged the knife. The painting shrieked, crying like a dying dog. I stabbed the wretched thing again and again, tearing it to shreds. The painting pushed back, knocking me off my feet. As I fell, the knife flew from my fingers, cutting me badly, staining the carpet a deep crimson red. I fled to the washroom, trying not to get blood everywhere. After cleaning my wounds, I returned to the living room with shaky hands and wobbly feet. I had to clean the blood-stained carpet or my mother would kill me. Panic attacked. Tears trickled down my cheeks like freshly flowing stream. You can do this, I told myself, sobbing. What happened next still haunts me. To my horror, the painting was hanging on the wall, unscathed. The light inside the tallest building flickering the devilish face inside, seething. Then, it spoke. Nice try, 
Zack. I screamed, ran to my bedroom, wept. From then on, I started counting down the days until I could move out and live on my own. This became my life's mission. To everyone's surprise, including my own, my grades slowly improved. They had to. Otherwise, I'd never go to college, thus being stuck at home forevermore. Unfortunately, whatever was haunting those paintings was now controlling my sister. She became erratic. She had no friends to speak of, her dancing days long gone. She stopped eating, and whenever someone spoke to her, she'd call them horrific names. Mind you, she'd just turned 13, so my parents thought it was a phase. It wasn't. All she did was paint. Her third painting was unlike the other two. It was a montage of calico colors sweeping across a stormy sky. Clouds sneered as they rolled along the smoggy skyline atop a frigid flurry of radical shapes. It was striking. I'd never seen anything like it. My parents were enamored. Friends and relatives gathered to gaze at it, praising its splendor. She hung it in her bedroom, above her desk, away from prying eyes. This suited me fine. I hated the thing. I knew right away it would cause havoc, which it did. As usual, everyone thought I was jealous and continued lecturing me for being selfish. Little did they know. One day after school, her bedroom door creaked open. Whispered words whisked from the creatures living in her paintings. At first I thought it was coming from outside. Maybe the kids next door playing in the yard. Then it spoke my name, beckoning me. Against my better judgment, I poked my head inside, just for a peek. The room was coffin dark. It smelled like a corpse. The room started shaking. The floor trembled. My sister was hovering horizontally above her bed, frothing. Her eyes rolled into the back of her head, arms folded on her abdomen. She was in a trance talking in tongues. I took a tentative step towards her, unable to stop myself. I noticed the paintings rocking back and forth on the wall. A creature flew out of them, forcing me backwards. Without hesitating, I flicked on the light. Tracy fell with a thud. Her slitted, bloodshot eyes peered at me, full of venom. The creature spoke. Go away. Creep. Go away, creep, my sister repeated, clearly entranced. I did. Needless to say, I've never spoken to her again, except on birthdays or holidays, and even then only a sentence or two. My sister continued to paint, while maintaining a life of solitude. Guidance counselors, teachers, and doctors alike were perplexed. No one knew what to do. She was a freak. But damn could she paint. By the time she finished high school, the entire house was cluttered with them. Each one exhibiting odd behavior. My parents could no longer deny it. Fortunately for me, I was long gone. College to the rescue. One day, while visiting, she'd be about 17. My sister was waiting for me, dressed head to toe in black, her ashen face like an autumn moon. She was holding a painting. Here, she said, arms stretched out. She handed me the painting, shakily. I took the painting, vowing to burn it the moment I got home. The painting snapped like a crocodile, threatening to tear my left arm off. I wanted to hate the thing. I really did. Problem was, part of me liked it. She painted me as a young boy, pitching on a mound of green, hand in weathered glove, eyes cold as steel. My hair was blowing in the breeze, 
A bloodthirsty crowd roared its approval, waving signs and foamy fingers. The smell of Cracker Jacks and freshly grilled frankfurters was pungent. I said thank you, and carefully placed it in the back of my car. The painting protested and complained the entire ride. I swear I heard the announcer call me a chicken shit coward. Once home, I lit it on fire, tossed it into the dumpster out back. The stupid painting didn't stand a chance. It came back. The following morning, the first day on my new job no less, it was hanging on my wall next to the flat screen TV. Except now, the crowd was quarreling, causing a ruckus. As I got closer, someone in the crowd started waving. A shadow emerged. I'm back. I spilled my coffee all over my couch. After cursing and cleaning it up, I scurried out the door, buying breakfast on the way to work. I was on my lunch break. I called my landlord, informing him that I was moving. I hired a moving company, found a cheap place on the east side, and never set foot inside that apartment again. This story should end here, but it doesn't. It gets worse. And believe me, I've left most of it out. You've read the Coles notes, if you will. I could expand this story by a hundred pages. Easy. Like the time her painting made my mother spill a glass of red wine across her beige blouse, right before her board meeting. To my dismay, my mother blamed me, the nerve of these people. She hadn't heard the painting snort, rejoicing in her misfortune, but I did. Or the time my father was in his workroom, using the circular saw, Tracy's latest painting was overlooking him. The saw fired up on its own. Cutting off his thumb and forefinger, doctors were able to reattach them, but still. Or how my sister started reading our minds? That was awful. She knew stuff that was impossible to know. Like how I had a crush on my grade 12 teacher, Miss Peabody, or that my mother was cheating on Dad with his best friend, Carl. Or how my father had peculiar porn fetishes, abhorrent even in this day and age. Gracie cheated on all her tests. Her teachers suspected this, but couldn't figure out how she did it. She was an A-plus student who never studied a day in her life. Sadly, she's remained a recluse. No one likes her, including me, but I'm her brother, and a part of me still loves her. The problem is this. My sister is famous, or at least her paintings are. They've sold all over the world. She's made a fortune. You probably have one of her paintings hanging in your home. Or at your work office. Hell, every dental office in America has one. And they're haunted. Tracy is a pseudonym. I can't say who she really is. I'm terrified she'll find out. She'll send over another painting. I shudder at the thought. I'm worried about you. The listener. You probably haven't put two and two together, that since purchasing one of her paintings, your life has fallen apart. But I'll bet it has. Burn it. Pray it doesn't return. You're cursed. You just don't know it. But you will. Her paintings are possessed. Every damn one of them. No wonder everyone is so agitated these days. I've been in construction my whole working life. I started straight out of school 10 years ago, and I've spent much of that time on the move. Not a lot of people know this, but when the job ends, craft workers are mostly laid off. Pipe fitters, carpenters, crane operators, all gone. 
That means we need to pick up our tools and head to a different job site, hoping to get hired back on. Since the money is good, that's what I do. It's the life I've always known. Every few years, I just travel from one side of the country to the other, hoping to find work. After my last job ended, which was about a week ago, I received word from my old boss that this oil company was hiring. He said that since I was a good worker, I was just hired. Just show up and get to work. Told him to give me a few days, and I'll be there as soon as I could. As for the location, it was some small town out in Illinois called Brookfield. I'd never heard of the place before, but that was nothing new. Most plants were built in the middle of nowhere. This is in case they explode. The loss of life would be minimal compared to the same disaster in a city. The next morning, I picked up my stuff and started driving. On the road, I called and spoke to some guy named Trevor over the phone. I found him on Craigslist. He was renting a room, and the place was about what I wanted to pay. Hey, I'd love to have you. Through the phone, his voice sounded jovial. I'll get some clean sheets on that bed and an extra set of blankets. It gets a little chilly this time of year. Oh, sir. Thank you so much. I'll see you when I get there, I said. After driving for about ten hours, I finally arrived at Brookfield, and it was... Nothing like how I expected. I've been to some shitty towns before, but this one right here? Their downtown could have easily been made into a setting for the walking dead. Most of the buildings I drove past looked either abandoned or half demolished. Some had girders sticking out from the sides like exposed ribs. Electric poles lay broken in the streets. One place that might once have been a gift shop looked like it had been burned down the night before. Parts of the blackened wood were still smoldering. The only buildings I saw that were intact were a police station and a waffle house. Also directly in the center of town, there was a random graveyard. Not the sort with freshly mowed lawn and a neat tombstone set at regular intervals. This one had crosses. The kind made from two sticks roped together, buried in the muddy soil. Mounds of dirt sat next to freshly dug graves. Trees, their limbs twisted and gnarled, were scattered through the area, casting misshapen shadows. One of them even had a noose hanging from its branches. It swayed gently back and forth. I couldn't help but wonder if some kids had put it up there as some sort of sick joke, or if it was meant as a threat. A threat to whom? I had no idea. Swallowing around the tightness in my throat, I continued on, followed the GPS on my phone, and arrived at the place listed. Trevor was nowhere to be found. Instead, there was a handwritten note taped to the door. It read, Sam, sorry I couldn't be there. Something came up out of town and I gotta take care of. Just hold on to the rent for a few days. I'll collect it as soon as I get back. Keys in the potted plant. Head on in and make yourself at home. Trevor. There was an arrow at the bottom, drawn in Sharpie, pointing down and to the left. I wouldn't have exactly called the object beneath a potted plant. More accurately, I would have said that it was a pot of dusty soil with cobwebs and a small bare branch sticking out of the center. I jerked a shoulder, dug the key out of the dirt, and did as the paper said. The next morning, as I made myself a pot of coffee in the kitchen, I found myself studying the pictures on the walls and the elderly gentleman who featured in a number of them. I assumed this was Trevor. In one picture, he was fishing. In another, he was at a family function, swinging at a piñata. He had a kind face, smiling in every photograph. I thought that once I met the guy, we'd probably get along nicely. After pouring my cup of joe, I headed outside, ready to leave for work, when I saw something on my windshield. There was an envelope placed under my wiper. Confused, I collected the envelope, pulled the paper out, 
and read it. It said I'd been fined $100. Literally, you have been fined $100. No explanation. What's more, it was written on a normal sheet of wide rule loose leaf paper in red crayon. Listed on the bottom of the paper was an address where I was supposed to mail the cash, check, or money order. What the shit is this? I thought to myself, flipping the paper over and inspecting the back. It had to be a prank, right? So I did what anyone would have done. I shrugged and tossed it in the back seat where it landed on the floorboard. Then I went to my new job site where I worked as a crane operator. Most of the day I was up in the cab, transporting steel. It's a hard, lonely life, but I was okay with that. It was good money. I didn't even mind the fact that I didn't get toilet breaks. I'd just carry a bottle. High up in the cab, I saw other craft workers milling about, doing their jobs, flagging, sanding, and pipe laying. Since it took me 30 minutes to climb out of the crane, most were already gone by the time I got down. As for that odd note, I wanted to mention it to my old boss, ask him if he'd ever heard of it, but it seemed like he hadn't come in that day. So I just got on with things, finished for the day, and went home. The following morning, when I went out to my car, all of the windows had been busted out. The windshield looked like somebody had taken a sledgehammer to it. To say I was pissed was an understatement. What the fuck? I said to no one, throwing my arms wide, approaching my vehicle. Once again, placed underneath the wiper, was an envelope. This one read... Warning, mine is now $200. Pay or you will be sent home. Of all the things I've seen through in my life, this was probably the weirdest shit ever. Especially bizarre was that I hadn't heard the glass shatter last night. Surely, I thought, I would have heard it considering I was a light sleeper and my bedroom window was only a few feet from the car. Fueled with anger, I crumpled up the letter. I wanted to blame Trevor for this. The guy hadn't come back home yet. I was the only one here last night. So if it wasn't him, then who was leaving these fines? Still pissed, I removed what was left of the windshield, got in my car, and drove to the address listed on the sheet. In my opinion, this type of behavior warranted an ass-whooping, and I was ready to give it. But when I got to the location, it was not exactly what I had been expecting. It was the damn graveyard in the center of town. My blood chilled as I slowed the car to a stop. The eeriness of the situation made the hair on my arms stand on end, and a twinge of nausea twist in my gut. I didn't know what to do. So I stared through the emptiness where my windshield would have been for a few minutes, gaze wandering across the grave markers. Eventually, I got myself together. The police station was across the street, so that was where I went. It was convenient, considering I needed to fill out a police report to file my insurance anyway. Inside the station, I found a fit, middle-aged police officer sitting behind a wooden desk. The officer typed away in his computer. How can I help you? I put the envelope down on the desk. Yeah, well, I got this fine and... Silence fell across the entire police station. Behind him, every head in the room swiveled in my direction. Concern colored all their faces. Some huffed out worried breaths. Others quickly returned their attention to their papers, scrolling fast, avoiding eye contact with me. One guy looked angry, like he really wanted to kick my ass. The officer swallowed. And, uh, where did you find this exactly? Somebody left it on my car. 
His eyes widened as some type of realization flashed across his face. His hand bounced, knocking on the wood. What is it? I asked, feeling my heart rate elevate. The nausea surged again. He cleared his throat. (coughs) He patted the envelope on the desk and slid it back to me. What's your name, son? He asked. Sam. Sam Chavez. He nodded. Well, Sam, I'm going to need you to pay this. What? You're going to have to pay this. I don't understand. The man leaned forward with a hard stare. His hand landed on his gun. Is there a problem here? What the hell? I thought. I swallowed, trying to regain my composure. Well, can I just give you the cash then? No, he said. I was lost. Well, uh, why the hell not? Because you have to mail it in. What? You getting loud with me, boy? I blinked. Huh? -huh? Pay the fine. Now get the hell out of here before I put you behind bars. Are we clear? Leaving the police station, I was so confused. I was actually scratching the back of my head. This was so insane that I didn't know what else to do. I needed something. Answers or some shit. Or at least to find out who was doing this. I tried calling my old boss to ask him for some advice. No answer. I even tried calling Trevor. Same. So I drove 50 miles out of town and stopped at a Walmart. There I picked up an outdoor nest camera and then headed back to my place. After setting up the camera, I installed the app on my phone and paid the subscription service to actively record all movements. Then I fell asleep. That night, around 3 a.m., my phone buzzed. alerting me that there was motion outside. Half awake, I clicked open the app and saw a truck pull to a stop in the driveway. I recognized the man who got out from the pictures I'd seen, so I knew it was Trevor. He slammed his door and made his way into the house. I considered talking to him, introducing myself, but the guy was probably tired. It was 3 a.m. after all, so I closed out the app and went back to sleep. That morning... As I came out of my bedroom, I saw something in the hall that made me freeze. Blood. I was almost sure it was blood. It had that smell. A trail of splatters led to the kitchen. I followed. There, I found Trevor. He was lying on the kitchen counter chest cracked open like an alien had bust out of it. Ribs spread, mascara scattered all over the tile and sink. His face was twisted in horror, his mouth wide open, his lips stretched in a silent howl of agony. In his hand was an envelope that I was all too familiar with. For some reason, it was the cleanest thing in the kitchen. There wasn't a speck of blood on it. The letter hung down low, angled, so that the wording faced me. It read, This is the cost. Fighting either a panic attack or a nervous breakdown, I staggered back and vomited onto the floor. I sucked in a huge breath, trying to force myself to calm down but I couldn't hold it against the next rush of vomit, and I spewed the rest of my dinner onto the kitchen floor. Coughing and gasping, I wiped my mouth with the back of my hand and scrambled away from the body. After gathering what little rationality I had left, I fished my phone out of my pocket and dialed those three numbers. What's your emergency? Said the lady on the opposite end of the line. 
I took a deep breath. The air still smelled of blood and vomit. Uh, hi, my roommate. He he's dead. What's the address? 212, 212 Silver Drive. A man is dead. Her voice sounded terse, maybe even annoyed. Yes, how did you... This is why you pay the damn fine, she said. So I did. I mailed in a check that night and got the hell out of Dodge. I'm used to living on the move, but I've never packed up so quickly. I left the body just lying there as I cleared out. Someone else's problem. I'd had enough of this bullshit. Screw that creepy ass town, the job, and the damn graveyard. I drove all night, heading for my parents' house, which I knew they had an old bedroom waiting. I didn't want to wake them, so when I got there, I used my spare key to let myself in. Something was waiting for me on my old bedroom door. My blood froze. Scotch taped to the wood was a note. Same familiar handwriting. Same red crayon. And I realized that maybe I'd made a mistake. All along, the notes had been delivered to Trevor's address. Trevor had been the one to die. Perhaps whoever, whatever, had sent those fines. They hadn't meant any of it for me. But now... I had their attention. The note read, Who are you? Numbly, I pushed the door open. I was just... tired. I didn't know what to do. What the hell I'd gotten myself into. I had the idea that I could collapse into bed and figure something out later. Inside, the walls... The bed, the desk, all of them were plastered with hundreds of wide roll loose leaf paper. Who are you? They demanded. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? you? 